So now we have talked a lot about the various development, the structure and other things. We'll now touch base about the overall hypothalamic pituitary axis because this is the core as far as the pathophysiology of any disorder is concerned. So we know that we have got the hypothalamus, which is the prime regulator, pituitary, which is the intermediary, and then you've got the end organ. So we have growth hormone releasing hormone, which is regulating growth hormone, which is then acting directly on the liver to cause IGF-1. I'm giving you a very simplistic model. We talk about the somatomidin hypothesis, the GHRH, GH, IGF-1, which was a typical hypothesis and growth hormone inhibits GHRH, which is a simple mechanism. IGF-1 inhibits GH, which is a feedback mechanism. Then we have the second group, which is the thyrotropin releasing hormone, which regulates your TSH which regulates your thyroxine. This is a straight one and thyroxine is inhibiting TSH and thyroxine and TRH is being inhibited via TSH. So this is a single mechanism. Now dopamine is interesting. Till now we are talking about peptides. Dopamine is a simple derivative of amino acid. It is inhibiting prolactin. I have talked about two which are stimulatory and I have talked about one which is inhibitory. And when I talk about others also, they are all stimulatory. So the predominant tone that hypothalamus sets for pituitary is stimulatory, with an exception of prolactin. Why do you think there is a different evolutionary selection for prolactin as compared to other hormones? So prolactin, the default mode is switched off. For all other, the default mode is switched on. Yes, so it's like a luxury. It's only needed by lactating women. Why do you need prolactin at all? If you have got zero prolactin, if you've got no prolactin receptor, you will have no problem in your life except for lactation. So it's like an AC switch, which should be default in an off mode. The others are life-saving. So that has to be default in an in a on mode. So this is important from that regards. Now CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, regulates the ACTH. And this ACTH regulates the cortisol, we know, and it also partially regulates aldosterone. How much of aldosterone secretion is regulated via the ACTH? 10%, yes. So, it's not that it does not regulate at all, but it's not the major determinant. The major determinant is the renin aldosensin system. Cortisol inhibits ACTH, cortisol inhibits CRH, ACTH inhibits CRH. So, all this process, we all know about that from that regards. Now, GnRH is a very interesting hormone. How many peptides are there in GnRH? 10. So, it's a decapeptide. And <clears throat> this GnRH is going to regulate. So, you've got two types of GnRH. One for LH, one for FSH. <clears throat> so, same molecule is regulating both LH and FSH, which again is a very economical way of doing that. Same molecule regulating two different hormones, but those different hormones have got different levels. Why? And so if you got too fast, so body has developed a mechanism, I don't want to, it became lazy. <clears throat> the evolution said, okay, I don't want to create another uh, LH regulating hormone or IFS regulating hormone, let's use one. So if it gives a signal that if you go fast, more LH, slow, more FSH. And then, of course, LHFSH have got a differential half-life. That's why they will have, if you stimulate one, it will be there for a longer time. Other will be for a shorter time. So that's why your levels will be different. And LH and FSH regulate the ovaries and testes. We know that the LH is regulating the Leydig cell and the Theca cell. And FSH is regulating the Sertoli cells and the granulosa cell to produce testosterone, estrogen, sperm, zoocyte, all those things. In a bin B, you can add a lot of it. But these are the most crucial system that I have mentioned about from that perspective. Now, <clears throat> of course, testosterone or estrogen is going to inhibit LH. I don't want to go into that, whether it's the estrogen which is regulating uh, LH or FSH more or it's testosterone, but it is the basic mechanism. Now, one axis which is entirely different from that is the AVP axis. And this, of course, the hypothalamus is not regulating. It is directly controlling. So it is so important that it has not even given the responsibility to the pituitary. So it's like you see that there is a, a, a sort of a cabinet in which you have got prime ministers taking some particular positions by themselves. So this is like this position I cannot give. I have given 5% to the median eminence and then I'm also taking it myself in control because that's the most crucial. The most regulated 
ओवरऑल सिंगल पैरामीटर इन ह्यूमन बॉडी इज ऑस्मोलैलिटी वन परसेंट चेंज इन ऑस्मोलैलिटी इज गोइंग टू मेक अवक वाइल ग्लूकोज वी से ओके योर रेंज इज एटी टू वन ट्वेंटी सिक्सटी लेस देन सिक्सटी आई गोइंग टू वरी टू हंड्रेड मोर देन आई गोइंग टू वरी कैल्शियम ओके यू कैन से ओके एट टू टेन नो प्रॉब्लम हियर यू से ओके इट्स टू एट्टी टू टू एटी फोर that's the range very very small range so that's why the most important single parameter from a evolutionary perspective probably what we see here is avp and that's why avp is directly coming from the hypothalamus now avp we all know talk uh, works on the kidneys to regulate the increase the permeability of the tubule that's it collecting duct permeability to water is increased by avp it's making them more permeable and taking more auspect controlling the osmolality which is regulating that so this overall is a simplistic view as far as the hypothalamus pituitary axis and from that you can derive a number of disorders they will come so now this we need to understand about a few scenario so we have discussed that you've got a predominantly stimulatory tone for the entire pituitary with the exception of so now we have a 12 year old boy with lethargy has got low ft4 tsh is normal this looks like a central hypothyroidism low cortisol low acth central hypocortisolism lhf is just to undetectable so this looks like a pituitary problem now whether it is a primary hypophysial or a hypothalamic problem what is the best barometer of a pituitary versus hypothalamic lesion so i talked about clinical parameters so you first tell me two clinical parameters okay this is hypothalamic or pituitary The there will be other like temperature instability. Yeah, very late. Early DI. I talked about the DI and vision. So early vision, pituitary, and early DI, hypothalamic. But if you talk about biochemistry, very easy. So prolactin levels were done, which were found to be very low. So this was a primarily a pituitary lesion. So now this is the most important part of the entire talk because we already discussed. about the general axis how the hypothalamus pituitary and the end organs interact but what makes uh, pituitary physiology fascinating is that it's not a linear 1 2 3 there's a lot of interaction which are happening and that's what we need to understand when we diagnose multiple pituitary hormone deficiency when we treat multiple pituitary hormone deficiency and we need to understand that okay we are starting estrogen what is going to happen to the thyroid dose when we start uh, cortisol what is going to happen to your avp requirement so all those things will understand via this particular simple cross talk from that perspective so very interesting first of all to make it very clear there is a dual regulation between prolactin and tsh now there was a lot of work which was being going on as to what is the stimulatory factor for prolactin but it was found that the stimulatory factor for prolactin is actually same trh so this is again economy of evolution dopamine is inhibiting prolactin it is also inhibiting tsh trh is stimulating prolactin uh, trh is stimulating tsh but it is also stimulating prolactin so they you can say that they are similar they are cousins so this is more like a analogous situation where they are controlling that now if the dopamine is inhibiting tsh if you have a sick newborn in the icu you are giving a lot of dopamine your tsh will be low so that is another cause of quote unquote non thyroidal illness high trh stimulating prolactin is very very classical anybody with hypothyroidism uncontrolled disorder trh will be high prolactin will be high and therefore you will have high prolactin so anybody with hyperprolactinemia we say do two things if there is a girl in a reproductive age group do a hcg and also do a tsh before you do anything in terms of prolactin from that perspective so this is important so trh and dopamine cross connect with tsh and prolactin now we all know that prolactin inhibits gnrh reducing your lh and fsh level so if your prolactin is high your lh will be low your lh is low which means in girls you will have less theca cell activity less testosterone less cubic hair so that's why in hypothyroidism primary hypothyroidism uncontrolled what we say one y groom back syndrome short stature delayed puberty large ovarian cyst periods but good breast development no pubic hair development 
because the prolactin is high, your LH is low from that regard. Now, AVP is having a very, very important interaction as far as the ACTH is concerned. So when we talk about the regulation, we talk about CRH and AVP. AVP has an effect on ACTH. So if your AVP levels are high, your ACTH will be, and your AVP are high in, when you've got more osmolality or you've got hypovolemia. So in patients who have got congenital adrenal hyperplasia, who are on steroid treatment, if their doses of the uh, overall mineral corticoid are not good enough, your sodium may be normal, but the patient will have covert hypovolemia. And this covert hypovolemia is going to trigger your vasopressin. Vasopressin is going to trigger ACTH. It's going to trigger your glucocorticoid axis, high 17 OHP. Low dose of mineralocorticoid translates into a high dose of glucocorticoid. Every child with classical form of CAH requires a mineralocorticoid supplement. Many people say, okay, classical, simple virilizing form, sodium is normal, we don't need to treat. No, look at PRA. PRA will be high. You should treat them in that regard. So very good interaction of cortisol and AVP. Now, of course, if AVP is stimulating cortisol, how can you not have a feedback inhibitory mechanism? Otherwise, you will continue to have cortisol levels high. So cortisol inhibits AVP. So if you have a patient who has got cortisol deficiency, your AVP level will be, AVP level will be high. So you will have a SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone like presentation. Suppose you have got somebody with craniopharyngioma, your surgery has been done, you've got both deficiency of cortisol and AVP. Low cortisol means your AVP is relatively stable. So diabetes insipidus minus SIADH is zero. So you will have masked diabetes insipidus. The moment you start them on cortisol, their diabetes insipidus will become manifest. So this interaction of AVP and cortisol is also very, very important to really understand from that regard. So cortisol inhibits TSH. We all know that. So if you have somebody who has got Cushing syndrome, you may have a low level of TSH. Don't think that this is central hypothyroidism. If you have a non-thyroidal illness, your cortisol is high, TSH will be low. So if you have got a low TSH and a normal or low T4, get a cortisol done. High cortisol is non-thyroidal illness. Low cortisol is a scenario of a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. Cortisol inhibits growth hormone, which we know already. So if you have Cushing syndrome, do not do a growth hormone stimulation test. You will have a masked level of low amount of growth hormone. So this interaction and crosstalk is absolutely essential to understand. If you understand this, then management and assessment becomes very, very simple from that perspective. So we'll take a few cases to just showcase this. We have a three-month-old child with developmental delay of Sandeep. TSH is 120. FT4 is low. Thyroid scan shows a dyshormonogenesis picture. On neonatal screening, however, the doctor complained that my TSH was only 12. So, what do you think would have gone wrong? Why was this child missed? So, in other words, I want to ask you, what are the possible causes of uh, a false negative thyroid screening? And one I discussed just now. So, sick baby in which you have got preterm baby who is on steroids, whose steroids are high because of stress or who is on dopamine can all have a low level of TSH. So, it's a recommendation. Repeat after two weeks. So, that should have been done in this scenario. So, this is because there was glucocorticoid, there was dopamine. This is all inhibiting the, uh, the TSH level. So, this is some interaction which plays a role. 10-year-old boy with weakness, FT4 is low, TSH is borderline, looks like central. Cortisol is low, ACTH is normal, which is again low. So this is central. There is a partially empty cell up, you have seen. So do you think this is a central hypothyroidism, a primary hypothyroidism, a subclinical hypothyroidism, or some other explanation can be there for this scenario? So multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, any other explanation? I talked about cortisol and its effect. 
on TSH. So if you have got high cortisol, your TSH, if you've got low cortisol, your TSH may be high. So you have to be cautious when you have cortisol deficiency. This sort of a mild quote unquote hypothyroidism may not really be a true one. So anyway, at this stage, you will not give them thyroxine because the first aim is to re replace this cortisol, which is dramatically low. So after giving hydrocortisone, we found that after some time, the TSH FT4 was all normal. That is because this cortisol has an inhibitory effect on TSH. Cortisol is low, TSH is high. So this is something you need to keep in mind. This can also be a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. You need to get an MRI done in this case either way, but don't rush in starting thyroid in that scenario. Hmm? Starting cortisol, two, weeks two to four weeks, we need to check that. Hmm. Yeah. 16-year-old girl with menstrual irregularity, LH and FSH is normal, estrogen is low. So this looks like a hypo-hypogonadotropic hypo, hypogonadism. Prolactin is very high. So this looks clearly like a hyperprolactinemia. MRI is normal. She has dyspepsia and vomiting and she is on Razo-L, which is a very commonly used drug, levosulpride. What do you think? So, this is basically a dopamine agent and that's why your dopamine is being blocked. Your prolactin goes really high. So, this is something you need to be wary about how dopamine can interact with that. 15-year-old girl with primary amenorrhea, no breast, stage 2 breast develop, pubic hair development, height is on the lower side, normal workup, LHFSH is to the 0. What is the plan? So, we have to check for the, any other hormone deficiencies are there or not. And, and before that, anybody with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism do a prolactin before you go ahead with any other workup. So, hyperprolactinemia can also explain this scenario. 14 year old girl with delayed puberty. Breast 2, pubic hair 1, LH is low, FSH is low, estrogen is on the lower side. So, it's a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Prolactin is 60. MRI was planned. What would you like to do before you do the MRI? There is no drug history. So, there is no dopamine, no SSRI, no levosulpride. So, you have to do a thyroid profile, which is very, very important. So, TSH was found to be very high. So, before you check for prolactin causes, go for drugs, go for pregnancy, go for hypothyroidism, which becomes important. 12-year-old boy with craniopharyngioma, diagnosed one year and surgery was done. He is a known case of central diabetes insipidus on DD AVP. Now, suddenly his AVP requirement, parents say he is developing, not having urine output enough. So, we stopped AVP. Still, he doesn't have any polyuria. Now, what do you think would have been gone wrong? We've already given you the clue. Yes. So anybody who was having hypertension and suddenly the BP requirements go down, diabetes and the insulin requirements go down, hyperparathyroidism and the calcium requirements go down, diabetes insipidus and the AVP requirements go down, think of a cortisol deficiency, which becomes important. So, there was a hydrocortisone and then again, the recurrence of DI was found in that regards. 16-year-old girl with multiple pituitary hormone deficiency received growth hormone, now on thyroxine and estrogen, develops lethargy and weakness. Cortisol at 8 a.m. was okay, 156. Synaxin test was also 620. Now, what happened was that she was said, okay, nothing to worry. Now, suddenly she had fever. She went into shock and hyponatremia. So, what do you think went wrong here? Yeah. So, why was it missed? Two weeks later, she had this presentation. Any reason you can think of? Alapan? Hmm? Anything along with thyroid? Was so, what will estrogen do? So, estrogen will cause a falsely high cortisol level and which will also be high for synaptin stimulation. This is a very, very difficult scenario. If somebody on estrogen, what do you do in terms of the diagnosis? 
So deficiency diagnosis is difficult. People have talked about salivary cortisol as a marker. But then total cortisol, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. So this clearly, when you gave estrogen, your AVP, your requirement will also go up because CBG goes up and you will falsely say, okay, there is no cortisol deficiency. Four-year-old boy with MPHD, Dr. Alappan on thyroxine 50, started on growth hormone 25 microgram per day. Now FT4 goes down. Before that, he was fine. So after growth hormone, parents are saying growth hormone has caused the problem. Do you agree? So what does growth hormone do to thyroid requirement? Yes, so you will need more. So you should anticipate that. So they are correct that growth hormone has done it, but you should have anticipated and probably increased the dose also in that setting. So growth hormone may unmask the hypothyroidism or it may worsen, increase the requirement.